Hello, I'm Dr. Anil Goody, consultant in reproductive medicine and surgery and assisted conception at the Homerton University Hospital. Today I'm going to talk to you about a few queries that have come in rather than a specific topic. There have been a few consultants who have gone through the 200 odd videos online and come up with certain queries and I've taken time to go back to those queries which are very relevant and answer those questions. So let us, let us start with the first things. The question comes is what is the action of CC of clomiphene citrate? Yes, it fools the pituitary, doesn't it? It creates a situation where even though there is low estrogen, there isn't low estrogen, it creates a feeling to the hypothalamic pituitary area by occupying those receptors that there is low estrogen, thus creating a spike of FSH. The question now comes up is if you give it for five days, what happens? And why do you give it longer? Now, what does the pituitary give away? It gives out FSH and also gives out LH. That's why the baseline of LH tends to increase while the FSH continues to rise. That sustained rise of FSH does quite well. It tends to recruit more follicles. But also remember that the rise of FSH is also accompanied by a rise of LH. And the baseline LH continues to be slightly high. Now the second question is, again following up from the first question, what happens if you give clomiphene for five days and what if you give clomiphene longer? Both do very much different things. When you give clomiphene longer, you maintain that higher level of FSH much longer, but you also maintain a slightly higher level of LH. Now, I don't know how many of you are aware of the 2007 paper which came from Japan. Now, the Japanese use a huge amount of clomiphene in their mild stimulation IVF cycles. And what it demonstrated is that even though there is a rise of LH with clomiphene, there does not seem to be a huge a premature LH rise that occurs. And that LH rise in the entire series of more than a thousand cases was about three, two to three percent, which is very, very small. Now, what this doctor asks is that if you give only for five days, is it implicated in luteal phase dysfunction? To a large extent means unruptured luteinized follicle. And that is one thing we don't know. What we know is that with clomiphene, compared to gonadotrophins, the chance of having an unruptured luteinized follicle are more. Whether or not clomiphene does it, I don't know. Second is, does it affect luteal phase function? Clomiphene seems to cure luteal phase function and clomiphene also causes luteal phase dysfunction. Now, that again is cannot be explained very well. And I tend to have a very simple you know, view that if when you give clomiphene, you see low progesterone levels seven days after ovulation, even after a trigger, then reconsider whether that drug is a useful drug. And I think in those cases, it's better to abandon that those drugs. Again, if you look at a little Legros paper on clomiphene versus letrozole, when you compared which drug would give you more spontaneous ovulation, and letrozole beats clomiphene in spontaneous ovulation. And that is something important. About 10 to 15 percent of women will not have spontaneous ovulation with clomiphene. And that is something which you'll need to review that. Now, gonadotrophins work very differently. And if you start having doubts on how clomiphene is working, I would suggest take the focus on of clomiphene to gonadotrophins. Question number three. If we use clomiphene and IVF, what happens with the endometrium? Endometrial dysfunction or the side effect of clomiphene occurs in approximately 15 to 20% of cases. It certainly affects implantation and in those cases pregnancy is almost negative when we look at ovulation induction. 
Second, if you had a look at the paper I presented, which looked at the endometrial receptivity genes which are present, then clomiphene seems to decrease endometrial receptivity genes of at least three which were measured. So again, if you have a look at it, what would I do? I would prefer that if I use clomiphene in the IVF cycles, I would prefer to freeze the embryos. I used it mainly in poor responders. And I want people to have a rethink about how they treat poor responders. Egg donation is simple. It doesn't require thinking when you move a, a poor responder into egg donation. A woman often opts for egg donation for lack of funds and secondly, to keep a relationship going. Sometimes think differently. I have seen at least 30 women out of those who were asked for, to go for egg donation who managed to conceive and have a baby just looking at different protocols which can treat egg donors. Next question number four is stimulation in presence of unruptured luteinized follicle a question here asked is if the follicles are unruptured and persist on day two and three, can we start the stimulation? I am quite, and my views about cysts are very different from a lot of other people. You, textbooks are there to guide you. Textbooks are not there to plan every move of yours. And what I would suggest in this case is, where does a cyst come from? If a cyst is a luteal cyst, it can secrete progesterone. And yes, if you're doing a fresh cycle, its effects are present by lowering pregnancy rates. But a simple thing is, do a Doppler on the cyst, do a progesterone on the cyst. If your progesterone is low in the beginning of your cycle, if the Doppler showed a cyst is almost collapsed, then start stimulation. I see no reason why we keep delaying treatments with a cyst. And I have a very different view of looking at cysts in IVF. I would prefer to know what that cyst is, to see if that cyst will get stimulated, to see whether it compresses the other follicles. If not, then start stimulation. Don't spend time running behind cysts. Often, it causes more delay and more distress. Question number five is do we routinely check for ovulation with transvaginal ultrasound after an LH trigger? And he said this is a continuation of question four. I usually scan women 36 to 48 hours after HCG to confirm the dominant follicle has ruptured or not. Is it a good practice? Should we do the scan before an IUI after HCG trigger to confirm we're doing a post ovulatory IUI? Again, I would say a big question mark on this. I generally believe I, that in reproductive medicine, there are different ways you can increase your workload. Doing un unnecessary tests is one of them, and often doing estrogen tests or progesterone tests at the beginning of the cycle often ends up making you think more and do less. This is exactly, sadly, one of the things which you will lead yourself into. I would suggest that do not scan. The simple thing is give a trigger and do a seven day progesterone. If your progesterone is low, then there's something else happening. Now all the evidence in nature links towards sexual intercourse before ovulation. And I also feel that if you are planning to do an IUI, then do it between 24 to 36 hours after the trigger. Your problem will always come up is, why do we check that a trigger works in 36 hours? It does not. It can work up till 37 hours, 38 hours, and sometimes 40 hours. Also, what you may be seeing is a corpus luteum that has formed, but has not collapsed. And I would suggest that we leave doing it because the actions then are more worrisome because you would not know what to do. You would continue giving her more HCG and doing an IUI again. 
also look at the endometrium. The endometrium starts changing uh, with the progesterone effect. If you are still worried, do a progesterone on the day of IUI and you'll see a slightly rise of progesterone. If you look at the analog studies, the analog studies do indicate that progesterone levels rise after giving the analog trigger within 24 hours. That's something to be considered. Question number five. When do we repeat AMH after ovarian surgery? One is always do an AMH before surgery. One, a medical legal value. Secondly, it gives you very good insight into what the surgery should be. If you're a surgeon and who does not do AMH, irrespective of how good a surgeon you are, in the court of law, if a, a patient comes with premature menopause, you will have no leg to stand. And I would strongly suggest that do not do surgeries and ovaries without a preoperative AMH. Get an idea of how many follicles remain. Also, it is an advice that you would give patients. You tell them that your reserve is already low. Any surgery that you do is going to have an impact on your ovarian reserve. This cyst, if it increases in size, will also have an impact. For example, endometriomas also have an impact in lowering ovarian reserve, while surgery also adds to a decline. Which one do you choose? And that's often a discussion you have with patients. When do you test it? I prefer not testing the, the AMH immediately after surgery. Why? Have a look at the studies done in ovarian drilling. In those studies, AMH levels were known to decline rapidly after an ovarian drilling and then started coming up. I would prefer getting a better picture and doing it in three months time. And that is probably a safer bet. Question number seven. Endometrial receptivity in IUI. One of the talks my colleague Dr. Bahadur had said that should we stab the endometrium, uh, something like an endometrial scratch while we're stimulating. Uh, if you see, I've done a talk on, end, on endometrial scratch in IUI and the studies are very low powered. They are very incomplete and do not convey the right answer. And frankly speaking, we don't have the right answer. I would suggest that we should not do uh, a scratch during the cycle with the studies lacking. Question eight, which is a very interesting case. Uh, this is a 38 year old lady presented with premature ovarian failure and wanting a pregnancy. She had conceived naturally a year ago and has a baby. She was planning to go for egg donation. Her FSH was 60, her LH was 35.62. Both the ovaries were not visualized. Eggs were collected on a donor and the preparation started. In the first cycle, she required 60 milligram a day of oral tablets and twice an application of estrogen gel. Even after that, her endometrial thickness was six millimeter. This was started, and then in the next cycle, Progana was started six millimeter orally with estrogen gel. One to two days after period, she was then taking 16 milligram of Progana tablets and gel daily. Despite that, on day 11, her endometrial was six millimeter. It was increased to 18 milligram a day along with twice daily estrogen gel. However, on day 15, she presented with bleeding. The question is, how do you prepare her for a frozen embryo replacement cycle? This is a very, very good question. Let's get one thing clear. Estrogen is, oral estrogen is not a wonderful drug. See the amount of estrogen which has been given, 16 to 18 milligrams. Any dose that exceeds 8 mg of Proganova often does not work. You have to address the endometrial issue. Have a look at menopause and have a look at size of the uterus. I would never push a lady into treatment who has been menopausal with high FSH LH and low E2 levels and a uterus that is smaller. 
if the endometrium is extremely thin, less than one millimeter, that's what happens. I think building the endometrium takes time. Also remember that some of these receptors have gone. And oral estrogen may not be the right approach. I'm not entirely certain of, of estrogel gel because its abs absorption is erratic. And many countries do not use estrogen gel. The Americans move to subcutaneous syndrome muscular estrogen. The Europeans move to patches, which have a much better effect and can be measured. What would I do in this case? Option one is if you have patches, move to patches once in three days, 100 microgram of Everol. And that steadily builds up the endometrium over six weeks or so. Build it up, check for endometrial growth, give a withdrawal bleeding, go through two or three cycles of building the endometrium. And then if you want, start around two milligram of Proganova and patches. I've often seen this work better to produce a good endometrium rather than moving straight to treatment. What is certain in this case is two things. One, oral estrogen is not working. Second, the there is a problem with the endometrium. Rather than pushing her for surrogacy, I would suggest common things that happen commonly. She's not tolerating the estrogen very well. So stop the estrogen, move off to patches rather than gels and a very small dose of estrogen. Question number nine. Starting stimulation in PCOS without withdrawal bleeding. Good question. When we find ovaries that are quiescent and endometrium is thin, we can start stimulation without waiting for progesterone-induced withdrawal bleeding. However, sometimes after starting stimulation with clomiphene or letrozole, the bleeding start. Won't this delayed shedding of endometrium cause problems in endometrial growth? Thin endometrium, what is shedding? That's a question I would ask. I would suggest it that don't worry about it. What stops bleeding? Let's forget drugs. What stops bleeding in nature? The rise, the follicle growing, the rising estrogen, estrogen acting as a growth factor, rebuilds the endometrium. Exactly the same thing would happen. As the follicle starts building, as follicle recruitment starts, estrogen levels will start rising and then you'll see the endometrium building up. Do not worry. I think this is commonly seen and the endometrium often builds up. I hope you have liked these questions. I'm grateful for those who have sent me questions for across the world, many from India. It, is, it requires a lot of courage to send questions and say, I need clarification. Now, all of us need to keep learning. I read often, I read an article once, one article a day, because I need to learn too. I don't think there's anyone in the world who knows all. There is no shame in asking queries. If you send me your queries with detailed history, without incomplete questions, I will try my best to answer them. If I don't know it, I will read and come back and tell you what it is. What this will allow us to do is to improve the way we disseminate knowledge, where knowledge is not held and kept within closed doors and only spoken of in conferences where there are secrets. Knowledge is for all. If you do want this to continue, please share this video across. Let more people come into contact. I'm more than happy to answer your questions. Thank you.